Hi, everybody. Steve here again, and welcome to Pro Arms Podcast number 52. Mass was able to sit down and interview a many year veteran. We think it's 30 plus, so we'll leave it at that. Veteran of the Chicago Police Department, Lieutenant Bob Stash. Lieutenant Stash has been in 14 shootouts. He is, as a result, a highly sought after and respected trainer in firearms, tactics, and the mindset of surviving gunfights, and has some pretty interesting stories to tell. Mass, take it away. Hey, gang, this is Mass. Gail and I are out in Chicago. And we're talking with Lieutenant Bob Stash. Uh, Bob leads a tactical unit of about 35 people out here. And he has amassed quite a bit of experience and a great many lessons that he can share with all of us. Bob, welcome to Pro Arms Podcast. Thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about your police career? I started out in a, su of a suburb west of O'Hare in Chicago, a Chicago suburb, back in the late 1970s. And I left there to come to the Chicago Police Department in the early 1980s, about 1981. And I've been on the job ever since. I've worked prim primarily in, in plainclothes tactical units. I also was a homicide sergeant for a number of years on the city's west side. I worked in public housing just about all over the city, and I kept bouncing back to tactical teams. And inevitably, when I finally made lieutenant, they gave me a tactical team of my own, and that's what I'm commanding now. Bob, it's my understanding you've been on 14 shootings over the years. Absolutely. Could you tell us about uh, you know, the lessons you learned beginning with the first one? You know, it's uh, really hard to try to put into words the lessons you learn. I mean, the number one lesson I learned is that no matter what happens on the street at the end of the day, at the end of that eight-hour day, nine-hour day, 10 or 12-hour day, I'm the one that's going to come home. You know, I have a family that I love. I have uh, friends that I care to be with and that. And the number one lesson is that you have to do what you have to do to defend yourself on the street. I think sometimes a lot of police officers coming on to the job, especially in this modern era, no longer reconcile that fact before the academy. Many times they reconcile this fact sometime when they're on the street or they're already involved in their first shooting. And that's really not the time because that causes hesitation, it causes conflict within yourself, and you're not sure if you're doing the right thing. In a street gunfight, the most important thing, of course, is to survive. You have to come out as the winner. And the only way to do that is to have no hesitation, and no question that you're going to defend your life and the life of somebody else's if called on to do your duty. Bob, were you into guns at all before you became a law enforcement officer? Yes, I was, mainly in the hunting, though. Uh, I was a big hunter ever since I was a young kid. My, uh, my father and mother had friends that lived in Wisconsin, and they would take me out to their farm in the summertime, and I would spend time there cleaning the horse stalls and uh, you know doing typical farm work. And uh, the guy up there, Leonard Shepard, uh, taught me how to shoot, you know, started with 22s and that, and I always was in the hunting. So that's probably my relationship with guns until later in the years. Then I started getting into handguns a little bit and started doing target practice. When you came on, tell us what the firearms training was like in the start of the country for police. Well, uh, Chicago primarily, actually in the state of Illinois, it was a 40-hour course. That was, uh, well, needless to say, Moss, you know, you know what it's like in those days, it was all revolvers. Uh, nobody had, had semi-automatics. They, they still weren't a very popular item at that time. Few departments did. But the firearms training was basic, typical, what I call firearms training. Uh, you learned the basic fundamentals of handling the revolver or a semi-automatic if you were so inclined to have one. You know, that dealt with stance and grip and trigger control and sight picture and uh, breath control and everything else. And then you fired typically courses that started at uh, 7 yards and went out to 15 yards and then 25 yards, primarily shooting at bullseye targets. Some of the qualifications, you'd end up shooting at silhouette-style targets. And then you shot for, shot for a raw score. And in the state of Illinois, you had to qualify with at least 70% of that raw score. There was virtually no combat shooting. This was usually two-handed shooting, either from an isosceles or weaver's stance. But there was no combat shooting. There was no real heavy time pressures. There was no speed loading or anything. It was in set phases of three rounds or six rounds, and everyone was given time to dump those empties in the bucket and reload your cylinder and get ready for the next qualification phase. Firearms training from that time to today has come dramatically around the full circle. 
Safe to say that training didn't really prepare you for your first gunfight? No, nothing prepared me for my first gunfight. I, I never planned on getting into a gunfight. I'm the first one to tell you that anyone who does involve themselves in a gunfight usually made a mistake somewhere along the line because I'm a big advocate that the way to survive a gunfight is never to get in one in the first place. And you can do that through risk aversion and tactics and everything else. Uh, the first time it happened, it was total shock. You know, I never expected it. I heard gunfire. I ran to the scene. My partner was there. There was a guy with a knife. He was attacking my partner with the knife. And it was like, oh, my God, what's happening in front of me? And it was my partner who was yelling, help me, help me. He was out of ammunition, shot this guy multiple times, and the guy still kept coming. And he said, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. And uh, I guess you, I, the, the word to use is instinct. You know, instinct took over, and I raised my revolver at that time and I opened fire and eventually I stopped that guy and uh, that was the first one. Bob, that first gunfight of yours, like Jim Cirillo's first gunfight, turned out to be perhaps your most famous. Yeah, absolutely. Could you, could you tell us the details of that shooting, your partner's the, name? The individual that was involved was a 23-year-old uh, uh, Cuban uh, immigrant who had come over on the Mary Alito boat lift in the early 1980s. Uh, got involved with a street gang up on the north side of Chicago, and uh, he was one of the main drug sellers. We had tracked this guy before and had arrested him before for selling narcotics and such. And we saw him across the street from a park in front of a couple of apartment buildings. My partner and I were, of course, working in plain clothes in a tactical team. Uh, the individual uh, looked like he was selling drugs, so we set up a surveillance and, in fact, did watch him sell drugs a couple of times, but he would always have small amounts with him, a couple of bags of heroin, and we were trying to find the stash. And inevitably, he walked into a lobby of an apartment building. My partner went in to follow him to see if he could find out what apartment he was going to. And lo and behold, this guy, instead of peeing behind a bush, decided to go into the lobby of the apartment building to take a leak behind the staircase. My, so my partner saw him, grabbed him, walked him out of the uh, front door of the apartment building into the little courtyard area in front of the front door and began to do a protective pat-down search. The guy shoved my partner out of the way, came out with a butcher knife, a uh, typical kitchen carving type knife, probably about a 10-inch blade, and tried to stab him with it. My partner pulled out his revolver, At the time he was carrying a 45 long Colt Smith, and fired six shots into the guy's chest at literally point-blank range. Well, that was silver tip hollow point? Those, those were silver tip hollow points at the time. And what was the guy's reaction? Uh, he sort of smiled at my partner, bent over, and said, now I'm going to cut your head off. Came at him with the knife. Uh, they grappled. My partner ended up dropping his uh, revolver to the ground, uh, went into his coat pocket, pulled out a five-shot thirty-eight, a J-frame, uh, bent the guy over, and actually put the gun to the center of the guy's back between the shoulder blades and emptied the cylinder into him, five shots. That was typical uh, Chicago police duty ammo, which at that time was uh, federal, 158 grain, lead hollow points, and plus P. Didn't even slow the guy down. Not an inch. He kept coming at him again. Now he's, my partner's yelling for me. I'm running up from up the block where I was in my hiding position in the bushes. We only had one radio with us. I had already called for help. And my partner slammed a uh, speed loader, trying to slam a speed loader into his snub to get it reloaded. I ran up. I had a Smith & Wesson Model 29. My partner says, this guy's going to kill me. Shoot him. I saw him with a knife. I saw him coming at my partner. They were within, like, arm's length. And I was probably about 15 feet away from the guy. And uh, I came up one-handed, started to bring my second hand up, and started squeezing off four shots. I hit him twice in the uh, upper torso. Didn't even slow him down. Um, I thought he had body armor on, and I went to shoot for the pelvic area because that's what they had always told us. My shots were a little low. One hit him in the thigh, and the fourth one hit him in the kneecap and blew his kneecap out, and that's what finally dropped him to the ground. That guy lived for 10 days after that shooting, died eventually in Cook County Jail uh, of those gunshot wounds. He had a total of 15 gunshot wounds. Uh, when they did a toxicology on him, he had a little bit of alcohol in his system, like 0.05, not even intoxicated. No drugs, no nothing. Again, I said he was 23 years old. He was about 5'7 and about 143 pounds. But he had something that a lot of people don't have. He had a will to live and a will to survive. He wasn't going to die. He was no, the you, scariest guy I've ever been in front of. No, you also were not exactly shooting light loads that day, were you? No, no. I had a Smith & Wesson Model 29, and I was firing 240-grain semi-jacketed lead uh, flat tops. 
Those were medium velocity. Medium velocity, magnums. 44 magnums. Absolutely. Didn't even slow them down. Well, my understanding was you hit more organs in his torso than you guys missed. Yes, we did. We blew a lot of, uh, a lot of his uh, entails out, let's put it that way. We ruptured his spleen, broke all kinds of ribs, uh, blew part of his lung out, uh, decimated this guy. I mean, physically decimated him. Blew a couple fingers off his hand when he held his hand in front of his chest. Uh, he just didn't want to go down. And this guy, like I said, had the will to live. And I'm a firm believer that if somebody wants to live and continue the fight, he's going to do it unless you can take him out permanently. What was your partner's name back there? Rick DeFelice. I guess you and Rick talked about that afterwards and decided the, the center mass thing uh, might not be all it was cracked up to be. Well, we, we started realizing that center of mass was fine and it worked, but you know this was in the age now when body armor was starting to get popular, and we said, Jesus, if a guy can stand up to that kind of shooting without body armor, imagine if he had body armor on, how would we stop him? You know, And uh, we decided that most of the shootings were at very close range. The, these were. I think uh, I fired my first round when I was about maybe... 12 to 15 feet away from the guy. I think I fired my last round when I was about six feet away from him because I was approaching him. My partner was literally at arm's distance and that. And uh, we decided that at those distances, we might as well, if we were going to get involved in a shooting and had to defend ourselves, we'd start going for head shots. And we started going to the range and practicing to shoot for the head. Now tell us uh, whether you were using aimed fire, point shooting, and how that evolved for you over the years. I've never been a big fan of aimed fire. Matter of fact, uh, you know, I've never really modified sights on my pistols or anything else. I'm not a precision shooter. I'm not the kind of guy that can hit a beer can at 60 yards with a, uh, a pistol or anything like that. I, I probably couldn't even compete at a PPC match in that because I don't shoot at long distances. I shoot primarily at what I consider to be gunfighting distances up close. And I allow it to be instinctive, almost like point shooting, I guess you would call it. I just simply say what you're doing is pointing your finger at the target, and your finger is just along the slide of the pistol, and put a pistol in your hand, and that's what you do. Instinctively, if you've got a firm grip on that pistol and come up with your arm, the coordination of your mind, your eye, and your hand will usually be right on target. And if you shoot with a percentage of 70, 80, 90% or above at very close distances, I mean... My intention at the end of the day is just to go home. I don't want to be an expert. I just want to go home. Bob, I noticed last week when I had the privilege of taking a class at Ailita that your point shooting style brings the top of the gun right up level with the eye. Yes, absolutely. One of the things is, is that I've always felt that when you're, you're shooting a pistol, you need to have what I call the, the triangle of sight. And the triangle of sight is very simply the eye to the target and the eye to the front sight or the muzzle of the gun where the muzzle of the gun is and then that forms a triangle. You've got your your target, front sight, and your eyes. Those three things come into a line you're going to hit what you're aiming at. The only sights that I ever used that I've modified any of my pistols with were the uh, XS Express sights. The only reason I like them is because it's a very small rear sight. It's basically a very shallow V. It almost looks like the fixed sight groove on most fixed sight pistols, but it's got that big ball in the front that sits on top of the front of the slide. And I found out a long time ago that as long as that front sight is on target, it's what Wild Bill Hickok learned back in the 1800s, you're going to hit what you're aiming at because where the muzzle is pointed is where the bullet's going to go. Now what year was that first shooting? That was in 19... Jeez, you got me now. 1983, I think it was. 1984. Tell us about the next event. The next one that I was personally involved in would have been probably a shooting in the 23rd District. Uh, it was an individual that was a gang leader. Uh, again, same thing. He was selling drugs. He was uh, um, working a, a crew on the north side around the area of Broadway and Irving Park Road. We had followed him into a building, that, a, a high-rise building that was notorious for having abandoned apartments that they were selling drugs out of. Um, we decided to stake it out, figured that he was going up either to collect the money or to collect some drugs in that in this building. We staked it out by hiding in a closet in the uh, lobby of the building. Lo and behold, the individual came down from the upstairs. He had gone in the building alone, but when he came down, he had two friends with him. Uh, unbeknownst to us, all of them were armed. 
They were in the lobby of the building. It's probably the size of this kitchen, maybe 15, 18 feet wide by about 20 feet long or so. We came out of the closet, produced our guns, identified ourselves as police and told these guys to, uh, that they were under arrest, not to move. All three of them pulled out guns and everybody just started shooting. And it was a, a mad dash for, for the shooting. This guy was the closest to us. Uh, his name was Larry Heron, and uh, both my partner and I fired simultaneously at him first because he was the closest target, and we both hit him in the head with the first couple of shots. He dropped, the other guys took off running, there was an exchange of gunfire, and the other two guys eventually got away and were arrested later. Now, as I recall, Heron was a pretty big guy. Heron? Yeah. Larry Heron was about uh, six foot three, I'd say, he's probably about 320, 340 pounds. Real big guy. Big, powerful Strong, you know, he was big and fat, but I mean, he was a strong, muscular guy, played college football and high school football, and he was a real big guy. What gun were you using on that occasion? That time I had a, a 45 semi automatic, a Smith. And uh, you've been in, my understanding is, 14 gunfights? Yes, sir. Tell us how your progression of weaponry changed over the years from the revolver to the, the SIG 45 that you carry now. Well, Chicago always allows you to carry a backup gun. Uh, back in the day when I first came on the job, the, your duty weapon had to be a 38 caliber revolver with the department approved ammunition, but they were pretty liberal on whatever other auxiliary gun or backup gun you wanted to carry. So a lot of guys back in them days when you had to carry a 38 revolver would supplement it with a lot of them would carry semi-automatic such as a government model or double action 9 like in those days the model 39 or model 59. Or guys would carry Browning high powers and that, or they would carry big bore revolvers. Many of us carried 45 long Colts, 44 specials, 44 magnums. As long as you can qualify, you can carry them. As the time went on, the department changed its attitude towards pistols that were uh, semi automatic pistols, that is, that were single action only, such as the government model 45s, uh, the Browning high powers, and that. And they pushed towards a uh, conventional firing system, such as the double single that you would find on a Model 39 or Model 59, or double action only. So a lot of guys started trending towards the high capacity 9 millimeters at that time, since they could no longer carry government Model 45s or Browning high powers. And then when Smith & Wesson came out with a, uh, uh, the double action um, 4586 is the one that I carried, and they had the, I think it was the 645. A lot of guys trended towards those as the big bore weapon to carry along with their 38 revolver. Uh, as that progressed on through the years with Chicago, they eventually went to a double action, only 9mm as a duty gun. And again, once you carried that, as long as you were within the parameters of the department, you can carry anything else as an alternate or an auxiliary pistol. A lot of guys like me, I've always believed that uh, the only reason I carry a 45 is because, as a Texas Ranger said once, they don't make a 46. And I'm a firm believer you carry the biggest bullet you can to get the biggest bang out of it. So that's why I've always carried either 44 revolvers or 45 semi automatics. Uh, what type of ammunition do you use? Now I carry uh, um, Hornady uh, XTPs, I believe it is. 230 the, grand or 200? Uh, 230. I, I'm also a firm believer that uh, what you carry the biggest bullet you can in the gun that the gun will hold. So there's no reason to carry a 180 or 185 if you can carry a 230 grain bullet. Same thing with the uh, 38s. You know, I'm a firm believer in the 158 grain lead hollow point. Although we've seen a failure with it when a shooting that I was involved in with my partner, Chicago has seen a tremendous uh, success rate with that particular round. So I'm a firm believer in that. Same thing with the 9 millimeters. I'd rather see a guy carrying a 147 grain than a 124, although now with the plus P rounds out there, you've got to reassess what you're looking at because some of the medium weight bullets, such as 185 grain, 45, and plus P, has got tremendous performance. Like 124 grain plus P and 9 millimeter, tremendous performance. And I'd rather now go towards that than the old, you know, big, heavy, slow-moving cartridges. Now, as my understanding, the 124 plus P and the Spear Load and the Winchester are standard issue for yes. those that take the, the company ammo. 
And I'm hearing also that it's working quite well for you and for other agencies. Absolutely. Uh, I'm telling you right now, I, my off-duty gun is a 9 millimeter, and uh, that's what I carry. I carry the Spear 124 grain plus P's in it, and it's a phenomenal load. And Chicago uh, issues in almost all of their, their calibers from 45 to 9 to 40 uh, is either usually Spear or Winchester ammunition and usually in that loading. It's a very, very effective loading. Guys are very happy with it on the street. We've seen a tremendous success rate with it. Good to hear. Which 9mm do you like for off-duty? I carry a, uh, a Sig Sauer P228. Now, in the 14 shootings you were on, how many times were you able to get two hands on the gun to control it? I don't think more than twice, two to three times. I've uh, only been in a couple where I've actually come into a firm two-handed grip. For the most part in a gunfight, what you find and what I found was that you're usually so occupied that the standard position that you're trained in on the range is a position you're never going to acquire. You know, I found myself, when you talk about a combat crouch, I found myself practically sitting on my butt a lot of times on the ground because I've tried to get so low either behind cover or just to be low and not present a large target. I found that my, uh, my offhand has normally been occupied with something, either holding a flashlight, opening a door, holding a person, pushing somebody out of the way, pushing some object out of the way, talking on the radio, uh, that I've tried to gear myself as much as possible that when I shoot combat distances out to about 20 or 25 feet, I try to shoot exclusively one-handed and learn how to control that weapon with one hand, and if I can hit with pretty good potential, in other words, a man-sized silhouette target at that distance, then I feel I'll have a pretty good success rate if, God forbid, I get involved in another gunfight. On, on the 14 incidents, tell us the, the range of distance that was involved, closest, farthest, average. The, uh, most of them were up close. I would say that the largest percentage of them were at very close range. I was only involved in two incidences that uh, there was distance involved. One of them was a, a sniper shooting that occurred on the north side where the uh, offenders were on rooftops firing down on the police. And another one was a barricaded uh, gunman situation in which a Chicago police officer, unfortunately, Richard Clark, was uh, shot and killed by a guy, a gunman, that uh, went a little crazy over... Uh, an argument with his landlord, killed his landlord and killed Richard Clark, who was the first responding officer. He was barricaded in the house and we were shooting it out across the street in an attempt to rescue Richard Clark. Unfortunately, you know, it, he was deceased at the time, but we didn't know it. So that was like across the street distances of maybe 30, 40 feet. It was more suppressive fire than accurate or aimed fire. But uh, Almost every time I've ever had a fire my weapon in the line of duty, it's always been at relatively close ranges. And I would say most of the time, the maximum distance was maybe 20 or 25 feet. Most of them occurred probably under 12 feet. In those more than a dozen instances, how many times did you need to reload and sustain fire? Only about three times. Uh, an incident in which one of my partners, uh, Alex Horstein, was wounded. Uh, he was shot through a door during a drug buy uh, where an individual fired through the door. That time I had to reload because, again, we were firing suppressive fire to get the wounded officer out. The incident on Lill Street and uh, one other time, uh, well, the incident on uh, Clarendon that I referred to in the second shooting I was involved in with the three gunmen, I'd emptied the magazine and uh, reloaded. And that was the only time. It was only those three times. In the uh, class that I had the good fortune to take with you, you still gave a lot of emphasis to carrying spare ammunition and to carrying a backup. Could you elaborate on that for our listeners? Absolutely. I'm an absolute firm believer that, first of all, any type of a handgun, especially a semi-automatic pistol, being a mechanical device, has the potential of failure. We've known throughout history and throughout law enforcement that if, in fact, a semi-automatic pistol fails, such as it suffers a malfunction, it's mostly going to malfunction due to either bad ammunition or bad magazine. Worn out springs, uh, a twisted follower, a broken follower, something to that effect. I'm a firm believer that on duty, no matter how many rounds are in that magazine, you should carry a minimum of two extra magazines. Um, if it's a nine shot like mine is, you know, it's an a I carry a P220. So the magazines are eight round magazines. I carry two, two extra magazines. I carry extras in the trunk of my car and in my duty bag and that, but on my person I always have at least two magazines. 
I'm also a firm believer that any police officer on the street should have a backup pistol, should have something if in the, in the event that either his primary weapon fails or in the event that he is disarmed and needs to defend himself. No police officer in, those, in a situation of a disarming is going to think about, first of all, utilizing a flashlight or grabbing out his combat knife or uh, you know, grabbing some coup baton or your wire stick out of his pocket to defend himself. In a deadly force encounter, that's not really the weapon to go to. You need to have a backup gun, also in case that primary weapon fails. So with the proliferation of semi-automatics now, I'm a firm believer in the lightweight 5-shot 38 as a backup gun. It could be carried in a pocket, it could be worn in a holster, it could be worn in a vest holster. Uh, I wear mine in an ankle holster, it could be worn in an ankle holster. I carry a speed strip in my pocket, so I even carry extra ammunition for my backup gun if I have to refer to it. And when you're dealing again with something that's mechanical, such as a semi-automatic pistol, I just don't believe in taking chances. I want to stack the deck as much as I can, and I want to stack it in my favor. Have you ever had to resort to your backup gun? I've drawn it a couple of times, but I've had not had to fire it yet, no. What, what do you carry in it? In my, uh, the backup gun that I carry now, uh, the snub nose I have to carry, the required duty ammunition for a snub nose, and it's, uh, I believe it's spear, 135 grain, jacketed hollow points. So plus B? Yes, plus piece. Now, it's interesting, after they named the 158 grain lead hollow point after your department, the Chicago load, right. to see Chicago carrying the New York load. Absolutely, it's How did amazing. that come to pass? I really don't know. You know, I don't work down at the academy, and I don't uh, train at our range. I, I mean, I'm not one of the trainers at the range, so I, I don't know how they came about that. I know that with the, uh, with the lightweight um, snub noses that we were carrying, specifically air weights and titanium frames, and that the the 158 grain plus P was basically a round that was designed for a three or four inch barrel pistol. And they weren't getting the proper type of ballistics out of it, out of the snub nose, you know, the 1.8 inch barrels, out of these little J frames and some of the Colt Detective Specials and Commandos that are, that are still out there. They were looking for a load that was made specifically for snub nose revolvers, and that's how they came up with this one that. They, I assume New York uh, made the recommendation to them. And now, for your snub nose revolvers, anything less than a three-inch barrel, this is the required duty load that you have to carry. But the, the old heads that are grandfathered with the four-inch service gun still carry the Chicago load? Yeah, the four-inch service weapon, you can carry either the 158 grain lead hollow point plus P, or you can carry this new load also in a four-inch barrel. It's that They leave the officer that preference. Same thing with us with, the, uh, with our ammunition. They've, they've changed a little bit now. Uh, they'll give you your duty ammunition, but as I said, we have approval for what's called alternate weapons. So, for instance, a guy coming on the job that is required to purchase, a, a, like now, a 9mm Glock, after he's off probation, he can go into one of the other approved pistols in different calibers, such as 40 or 45. And the department now ranges the ammunition, for instance, in 45, you can carry anything from 180 to 230 grain bullet, and it's your choice. And I think that's a great option because some officers can control certain loads better than other loads. It gives better accuracy and handling ability out of the weapon. Some weapons chamber some ammunition better. And I like the fact that the department doesn't say this is the only round you can carry. I think that's very forthright thinking and giving a little bit of a range to that particular stuff. Now, the stuff they issue for your approved duty weapon, they stay with a set type of ammunition. Now, which particular J-frame do you carry for backup? I carry an airweight, a model, just a standard model. I think it's a model 37, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, chief model, special style. Chief special, chief standard. special in uh, in the air, aluminum airweight frame. I'm not a fan of titanium. To me, it's a little bit too light, and uh, because I do wear the gun on an ankle holster, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go with a full steel frame pistol because it's a little uh, bulkier and heavier. And that. So I go with the air weight, and uh, when I qualify, I qualify with that. As a matter of fact, when I have to requalify, I have three J frames, and I have to qualify with all three. I have a Model 36, I have a Model 49, both in steel, you know, one being the hammerless, and then I have my air weight, and I have to qualify with all three of those. But I like the air weight in the ankle holster, and then the other is if I'm wearing uh, a backup gun in a shoulder holster or a vest holster or on my belt or an inside the pants then I might resort back to one of the steel framed uh, J frames, but for the most part I carry the air weight. Um, how many uh, rounds a year do you practice? 
I try to, boy, that's, you know, that's a, that's a hard number to come up with. Um, our range is open every Saturday. Uh, you can come down and shoot. You can, uh, the, the department will give you about 100 rounds a month to qualify with, uh, to practice with. I scoop up all the ammunition they let me. I try to go at least twice a month. I probably fire about maybe 500 to 600 rounds a month. And maybe out of the year, I go nine or 10 times besides our qualifications. So I'd say probably 3,000 rounds a year. I'd probably fire maybe 3,500. I notice your uh, your on duty holster since you work plain clothes is a thumb brake for your sake. Is that department required or personal choice? No, it's a personal choice. Uh, I'm in plain clothes. I wear a standard pancake holster, and I, I prefer pancake holsters. I like uh, the weapon to ride as high as possible, as close to the body as possible. And uh, I've had so many years of working with a thumb brake holster that I'm very, very comfortable with it. What made you pick of, of the many guns that you're authorized on uh, Chicago PD? What made you pick the SIG 220 in particular? You know, I, I, again, I like big bore uh, semi-automatic pistols. And uh, at the time, really, the, the two big bores that were out there that were double action only, of course, were the P220 and the uh, 645 or the uh, 4586. And uh, I, I liked the uh, P220 because it was not an all steel frame. It was built on an aluminum frame. It was a little lighter. And then the key to it is I, I think that the key to being a good shooter is to have a handgun that is actually an extension of your hand. And although I'm, I still have my 4586 and I still shoot it and I still like it, when I put the SIG P220 in my hand, it's like it's part of, it's like a sixth finger to me. It just feels good. And I'm a firm believer that anybody that's going to carry a, a handgun, especially one to defend themselves, don't carry what people recommend. Carry what feels best for you. You know, I'm a big advocate that you should go to a gun, gun store and just pick up every single one and keep your eyes closed. And the one you pick up that feels like you're pointing your finger, a sixth finger, that's the one you should look at. And that's the one you should think about taking out on the range and practicing with, see if it is as comfortable as it feels. And if it is, that's the one to buy and that's the one to carry. Bill Jordan once made the point to me that his first gunfight was the hardest and after that it gets easier. What's your take on that? You know, I've, I would never want to contradict Bill Jordan, who I think is probably one of the greatest lawmen that ever lived. But I think, uh, you know, they get easier only in the regards that you now know what to do and what the outcome is going to be, but they're still hard because... There's no way of knowing if it's going to be you or him, you know. Um, police departments uh, across the country, when they, they deal with officers, they'll always tell officers, you know, shoot to stop the threat or, you know, why did you fire because this guy had a gun and I was in fear for death or great bodily harm. And I try to break things down into a nutshell. You know, I'm a real uh, uh, street type of person, and I say when somebody says to me, why did you fire your gun? And, gun. I say, I fired it to live. I didn't want to die. He had a gun. I had a gun. I'm going to do what I have to do to live. And every time, every time you get involved in something like that, you know, the biggest fear is that you're going to be the one that's not going to come home. I've buried a lot of friends on this job, unfortunately. You know, I come from a big city police department that uh, suffered a lot of people killed. I mean, we've had over 520 police officers killed in the history of this police department. Since I've been on the job, there have been about 64 police officers killed, 13 of them have been personal friends of mine. And it's very, very difficult. I just buried a friend uh, this year, earlier this year, that was killed, unfortunately, in a on-duty traffic crash that was from our district. A nice guy, a real good friend of mine, Sergeant L. Haymaker, and I've known him for years and years and years. And that's not easy. So I think, you know, it's... It, it's not easy to take a person's life. It's not easy to fire a gun at another human being. But just like a soldier in combat, first of all, it's your duty to do that. If they didn't want me to do that, they would have never issued me the gun in the first place or had me carry it. And uh, I've, like I said, reconciled a long time ago, like people like Bill Jordan did, that if, in, if involved in a gunfight, I'm going to do what I can to come out on top so that my life is protected other policemen's lives are protected, and the innocent public's lives is protected. If that results in somebody else getting shot, a bad guy, or unfortunately that person succumbing to his, his wounds and dying, you know what, I've made my peace with God with that. I'm going to do what I have to. 
The only thing I look at sometimes is I look at those people that police officers have killed in the line of duty, and you figure these are usually the top criminals that are out there, recidivist criminals. As you well know, most crime is committed by a very small number of individuals in society. And when I sit at home and try to get uh, make peace with something like that, I say to myself, you know, although I took this guy's life, how many lives did I save? Had I not done that in his lifetime or his criminal career, how many innocent people may have he killed? How many other policemen may have he tried to kill in that? And it makes it a lot easier to understand that and reconcile it that this is your duty. And sometimes duty calls on you to do very hard and difficult things. In your career, how many men have you had to shoot and how many of them died? I've shot nine and uh, five of them have died. Oh, in your first gunfight, you and your partner were up against one armed man. In the second, you, were, you said you were up against three. How many of your shootings involved multiple offenders? Um, let's see, that would be just two of them. That, the, the incident that I referred to earlier and the incident with the uh, sniper shootings, uh, there were multiple gang offenders in that one. Or we don't even know how many people were involved. There were probably four or five involved in that one. Uh, that was the only time. Most of the other times, it was all one-on-one. -on -one. Now, after the first one, did you consciously go for the head when you could? At close range, that's all I train to shoot for. I'm a big fan of uh, six-inch paper plates as targets, and I usually put those on a T-bar, and that's what I try to practice to hit. If I can hit that six-inch paper plate with regularity, I'm certain I can probably hit the head at combat distances. Now, your department has a, a long and rich institutional history in, in dealing with the worst kinds of incidents like these. What well, one of the legends throughout law enforcement from mid 20th century is Frank Pape. I understand you actually knew him when he was alive. Yeah, I did. I, it, that was probably one of the biggest honors I ever had. Uh, uh, Captain Pape retired uh, soon after I got on the job, and I uh, worked at a short time in the 15th District as a as a young recruit in that. And uh, Frank Pape was the uh, watch commander at the time, and I uh, had an opportunity to meet him and speak with him. I mean, we never sat down and had lunch together in that, but. When I first came on a job, I really didn't know that much about him until I talked to some of the old salts in the district and said, you know who our captain is? You know, that's Frank Pape. You know, he's a, a legend in the Chicago Police Department. And lo and behold, when I started reading about him and looking into it, Frank Pape is a legend in the Chicago Police Department. Uh, he killed about nine guys in gunfights? He was involved in probably 20 or 25 gunfights. I believe he killed nine or ten, and uh, I don't know how many others that he that he shot. But uh, I know for a fact that one of his favorite weapons was the Thompson submachine gun, and he used it with uh, quite a bit of accuracy. He, he killed at least two guys with that. Yeah, he'd done two guys down that were involved in a robbery crew up on North Broadway uh, that were... You were waiting for these guys to show up, I know that for a fact, and uh, they showed up at a time to a, um, an auto dealership about the same time that uh, uh, a school down the block, I believe it was a grammar school, was getting out. And uh, I think Pape was a sergeant or a lieutenant in that time in a robbery squad, and he was concerned that if they waited to take these guys when they came out of the auto dealership, these kids would be on the street, so they sprung their arrest a little early. And, I guess these guys decided to fight it out, and Pape had the Tommy gun, and Pape won, and they lost. Now, his choice of personal handgun was not what we tend to associate with the gunfighters. Tell us about that. He carried a 38 revolver, standard 38 revolver. Uh, he had his, uh, I think he went to a tailor. Originally, I think his wife did it, but he went to a tailor and had special pockets built in his pants and in his suit coats and that, and he carried a couple of... Uh, 38 caliber revolvers. He used to carry stuff like police positives and back it up with detective specials. Uh, back then there was no speed loaders and that, so in those days, him and the crew that he had, they would sometimes carry multiple guns. You know, they'd carry a four inch 38 and then maybe two snub nose 38s so that they had sufficient firepower if they got involved in gunfights. But that was the primary weapon back then of the Chicago policeman, the 38 revolver, and uh, Pape was very good with a 38 revolver. And, I think that's what it came down to. You know, as I said before, if you, you carry what you're comfortable with and can shoot very well with, and Pape was very good with those 38 revolvers. I can attest to that. Well, I understand he had kept a 44 in his glove box just in case. Yeah, he had a, uh, he had a large bore revolver that he carried in his, uh, in his car all the time. They always had uh, uh, him and his partners. Some of his partners did, in fact, back in those days, uh, government model 45s were pretty popular. 
few of the guys in the robbery squad did carry those in case they encountered uh, people in the cars and that. And they carried, needless to say, heavier weapons when they would go on stakeouts or when they would actually go on active investigations. You know, like anybody else, they would they were the SWAT team of their time, so they would gear up. They would carry Thompsons and uh, shotguns, pump-action shotguns, and uh, uh, M1 carbines were real popular in the Chicago Police Department back in the 60s and that, and those were carried quite extensively by the detective squads and that. Did you ever have a chance to uh, pick Captain Pape's brain on advice on gunfight survival? I wish I could say I did, but I never had that opportunity. As I said, I didn't really know him that well. Uh, only for working for him for a short period of time. But uh, I, it's a guy that I would have loved to have sat down and had dinner with, God rest his soul. You know, I'd have liked, loved to have talked to him. But before Captain Pape, there was Frank Reynolds. Uh, now, he was probably already gone by the time you got... Yeah, Reynolds, uh, he, he's another legend in the police department. I don't know a real lot about him, but he left, uh, I believe, in the mid to late 70s, so I wasn't even on the job at that time. The, uh, the shootings you've been on, you've had uh, the first one, of course, with, what, 15 rounds fired yeah. and 100% hits before the guy went down. How many of yours have been one-shot events where you, your first shot took care of business? Only one. Uh, tell us about that one. Uh, it was an individual that was robbing a Burger King. He uh, was uh, hiding underneath a kitchen sink. There were several of us trying to get him out from underneath the sink. Uh, he had a Tech 9 in his hand. Uh, we didn't see it till the last minute. He started to bring it up and I fired one shot and it was about four or five inches from his head. That was 45? That was a 45. From what I understand, the firearms and tactics training on Chicago PD has improved greatly in the last few years. Absolutely. It's, it's phenomenal now and it's supposed to get better due to the fact that we're looking at some property on the south side of the city where we're actually going to build a a specific tactical range uh, that will uh, that will also allow us to uh, build a shoot house, outdoor range, will allow us to qualify with carbines, shotguns, all at the same facility. But the firearms training unit in Chicago has done a tremendous job of, of changing training from back in the 80s, evolving through the 90s, and now into the, into the 2000s. And the, the training that a recruit gets now, for instance, coming on the job is dramatically different from the training that I got. They're more geared up for what they're going to encounter in the street. Uh, they do a lot more tactical work, uh, tactics work with uh, uh, sight munitions, airsoft guns, the FATS training, um, all the stuff that's now available for the young policeman coming on the job that was a dream when I came on. You know, it was none of that. I remember back in the day, your guys mostly carried two guns apiece and knew what the knew what the score was, but the department wouldn't even let them carry shotguns in most of the squad cars. No, back in the uh, in in the nineteen sixties, we had shotguns in the squad cars. We used to carry them uh, as back in those days, as everybody did, mounted on the dashboards. But in some of the high crime areas, what we found out was that a lot of our squad cars were getting broken into and. Uh, scumbags on the street were actually stealing the shotguns. So then they took the shotguns and they put them in the trunks of the car. And uh, we would carry the shotguns in the trunks. But we found out that by leaving the shotgun in the trunk of the car, it was now susceptible to bouncing around and weather. And we started having mechanical problems with the guns. And when the street urchins found out we were putting them in the trunks of the car, now all they were doing was instead of breaking into the passenger compartment of the car, they were breaking into the trunks of the cars and stealing the shotguns. So for a long time, they took them out. And uh, up until uh, we started carrying patrol rifles now, uh, we didn't carry any kind of long guns in the cars at all. You would take them out for specific instances, such as stakeouts or raids or that, but that was it. I mean, uh, as far as a patrol car carrying a, a, a shotgun, even to this day, there's no shotguns on the streets in Chicago. Now tell us how the patrol rifle program has evolved. How many patrol rifles do you figure you have up? That's very difficult to say. Uh, the patrol rifle program in Chicago is not mandatory. When the new superintendent came in, he instituted a program where the physical fitness test, uh, you have to come and take this physical fitness test. Once you pass it, it, it that allows you to then go to patrol rifle training, uh, which is a standard M4 type rifle, a 223. 
Uh, once you qualify with that, you can either carry one of the department issued ones as long as you're assigned to a squad car that has one of the rifle racks in it, or you can purchase your own carbine that meets department uh, qualifications and standards. Then you have to come in and zero that weapon and, and run it through the firearms training unit and show your capabilities with it. And then you can carry your personally owned weapon as long as you're assigned to a car that has a rifle rack in it. Unfortunately, yet all of our cars don't have rifle racks. How many are actually on the street and how many guys are actually carrying them, it's hard to say, but I'd say in every district, you've got a couple of guys at all times that uh, have carbines available to them. For a long time, the authorized complement of sworn personnel has hovered around 13,000. And I can remember when you actually had 13,000. Mm -hmm. Tell us how the, the economy and the attrition have affected the department's strength. I think it's uh, like any police department. I mean, we're suffering from it. Uh, one of the things that we're also suffering from in Chicago is the fact that the, uh, the city and the police unions made an agreement where we can allow our officers now to retire at a younger age. At, uh, with 20 years of service and the minimum age of 55, an officer can now retire not only with his pension, but with his medical benefits paid until he's eligible for Medicare at age 65. So where officers would stay before uh, uh, this contract, that age was age 60. So almost everyone was staying regardless of time on the job till they're age 60 because the medical benefits were so important. Now a lot of those guys are leaving at age 55. And in addition to the attrition because of the bad economy, we've seen the fact that police officers have not been replaced. I believe this year so far we've hired maybe 50 officers, maybe 65 officers for the year when we usually were hiring in a neighborhood of 300 to 400 a year. Now with this massive retirement, a lot of these guys that are 55 or older are now leaving with this medical benefit. We're seeing not only the attrition rate but the increase in retirees and uh, we're losing policemen left and right. I mean, last month we had over 120 officers that retired in the month of March. And we're expecting in April to have about another 100 that are going to retire. And uh, it's getting to a point now where we see a lot of one-man cars on the streets. That was... Uh, you, you never used to see that. That was very unheard of. Uh, we had an unofficial policy that said from dusk to dawn, everything on the street except for supervisors or traffic cars or that would be two-man cars, especially the beat cars. Now it's very difficult to... Uh, to man those two-man cars. If you do, then you've got a lot less cars on the street. And we're, right now, as we sit here talking, you're experiencing such a wave of violent crime that people are talking about bringing in the National Guard. Yeah, well, What's your take on that? You know, Chicago is a great city for overreaction from its citizenry and its politicians because the, this, the, the pet answer to everything when crime goes up is bring in the National Guard, you know. I think what they really need to do is just Take a step back. Let's let's uh, let, let's look at it as an overall picture here. Although crime is starting to go up, you know our violent crime rate is starting to go up again. It's still a heck of a lot lower than what it was in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. I think the Chicago Police Department is doing a phenomenal job. I think this is the greatest police department in the country and the best. I think they have ter tremendous police officers, and all we have to do is just realign our strategies and our tactics to figure out how to tweak things a little bit better, and I think we'll get a hold of it again, and we definitely don't need the National Guard. Just like we're not gonna send Chicago policemen to patrol the streets of Baghdad, we don't need armed soldiers patrolling the streets here. I think we've come in and militarized our police enough ever since 9-11. Bob, would I be getting you in trouble if I asked uh, what your opinion was, not, not speaking for the department, but just personally? on armed citizens and the, the current case in front of the Supreme Court. Absolutely. I'm a firm believer in the Second Amendment. I'm a life member of the NRA. I'm a life member of the uh, Illinois State Rifle Association. I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe that every citizen has a right to own a firearm as long as they meet the qualifications, again, that the state governments or the federal government put in, such as somebody who's not a criminal in that. I spent a lot of years on the streets. I've taken a lot of guns off the streets, and very few of them were guns that were purchased at a gun store or gun show. They were usually acquired on the street illegally. They were usually possessed by convicted felons. They were usually stolen. Very few people actually walk into a gun shop. And again, the only thing I can say is take a look at cities like New York, Washington, Chicago that have very, very strict handgun laws. Yet, you just brought up a fact that you're seeing a 
wave of violent crime in the city. And since there's no gun stores in Chicago, as a matter of fact, no gun stores really that many in Cook County itself, I'm sure these guys that are acquiring these weapons are not just walking into a store and plopping down $500 to purchase a brand new Glock. They're breaking into homes and they're stealing them. And I believe that one of the reasons that violent crime is up in a lot of cities is that uh, citizens here cannot defend themselves and arm themselves with handguns. And I'm a firm believer that they should have that right. Bob, is there anything that uh, you care to add? Huh? That's about it. I deeply appreciate your time and having the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, we, we deeply appreciate your commitment, your service, and your taking thank the you. time today for our listeners. Thank you very much. All right, Mass, thank you very much. And again, thank you, Lieutenant Bob Stash from Chicago PD. Good stuff there, guys. Thank you. Anyway, thanks, folks. We appreciate your joining us, and we look forward to having you with us again whenever we put together podcast number 53. See you then. It'll be in a fortnight. A fortnight. Okay. Better than being in a shoebox, I guess. Bye, Steve. Bye, Gail. Pro Arms Podcast music is by Kevin McLeod.